right. Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're located. Let me just double check to see all these smiling faces coming in. I see Bridget. I see Christy Tucker. Thank you so much for for joining again today. Um, <laughs> what a wonderful beginning we had yesterday to Ideal 22. It was um, such an enlightening day. I, one of the things that really stuck out for me was um, something that uh, Lisa had said about, or she had shown a small video about, I think it was Brene Brown talking about belonging and fitting in. And I don't know, like I was talking, I was explaining it to my wife and thinking about it just yesterday evening and thinking about just my eight year old and how, you know, that's something I really want to be able to communicate to him. So, I mean, it was just so impactful sitting in those three sessions yesterday. And I know that for the rest of this week, we're going to have continue to have fantastic sessions for everybody. Um, here at Ideal 22, and which is a great segue to our next speaker, um, Bridget Brown, who has actually spoken at TLDC in the past. We did a storytelling series a couple, well, right before the pandemic, like you'd mentioned. Yeah, before. podcast on the podcast. Yeah, and um, and and so it's been a while, but I'm so glad you're back. Um, um, you're like a master storyteller, and I do have like a little bio that I can read off if you'd like. Um, Known as the geek translator, which I, I love that term. Um, C-suites, HR teams, sales teams, and entrepreneurs hire Bridget K. Brown to increase their expertise and the skills of their employees in making the comp complex clear in the stories they tell themselves and others. Bridget is a public speaking, storytelling coach, and master facilitator whose superpower is coaching and being a passionate cheerleader for clients, a certified applied improvisation instructor, which we're going to need that today, potentially, and 15 <laughs> plus years, 15 plus years of instructional design and facilitation experience. She combines her background as an actress, writer, and instructional designer. I love that combo. Um, that's always really, really fun to have um, in, in, in uh, at any of the events that we produce. Um, uh, combines her background as an actress, writer, and instructional designer by using elements of improvisation in her work. And with that, Bridget, I'll let you go um, with your session, examining unconscious bias and how it affects what we create. Thank you very much, Luis. I appreciate you, and I appreciate being here today. Hello. I know I have some friends on the call, so shout out to people that I've worked with in the past, and shout out to everybody who's new. Um, so this is a topic that's actually near and dear to my heart because when, so I teach regular diversity inclusion, uh, uh, DEIB classes for the state of Connecticut. And when I started breaking some things apart for myself, I really, um, wanted to find a way to describe it where people could really get it in a different way. So hopefully I've done that. Um, and feel free to, um, you know, put stuff in the chat if you have any questions and we will have time at the end for questions. So um, as a storyteller, here's one for you. When I was about eight or nine years old, my parents sat me down and they uh, gave me what I now call the Patsy talk. And the Patsy talk went like this. Patsy was a um, family, the daughter of a family friend of my parents, and she was overweight, especially for that time. This was many years ago. I'm a very old person. And um, she, my parents sat me down and said that if I didn't watch what I ate, I was going to end up like teenage Patsy. So my well-meaning parents at that particular moment in time basically said to me, you know what, who you are is not okay. Who you might be may not be okay. And you will not be surprised to learn that that was the beginning of a lifetime struggle with food, a lifetime struggle with body image. And so at every turn, as I got older, as I went into high school, as I went into college, the thoughts that passed through my head 
was all about how the world perceived my body, how the world perceived me, and how I dealt with food. That was what was going through my head at every turn. I didn't have control over those thoughts. And that's part of what we're talking about today is the thoughts that we can't, we, we struggle to control because they become unconscious in our brain. And this is a really important thing to think about because there's a difference between thoughts and thinking, okay? Thoughts, we don't control. Have you ever had a really weird thought that went through your head and you're like, why would I ever think that? Anybody? Whereas thinking is very purposeful. It's very much the situation where, um, you know, it's similar to breathing. Every one of us is breathing now, but if I told you to stop and tune into your breath, and take a deep breath, you're suddenly controlling your breathing. And our brain works much the same way. And this is proved by science. It's proved by science because there's this thing that we have called neuroplasty. And the thoughts that go through our head literally get wired into our brain. And it's not that we can't break those thoughts apart. We can, we can break them apart but it takes a lot of time and energy. So I was teaching this one time uh, for the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services for the state of Connecticut, and I had a psychiatrist on the line, and I asked him to talk about what this, this concept of neuroplasty and how our brain works. And I said to him, you know, uh, what do you say to your clients? And he said, I usually say, here at Catch It, Check It, Change It. So the thought goes through my head, I don't look good in those pants or whatever before I even before I even know I've had the thought. If I can hear it, if I can check it, then I have a possibility of changing it. So now I've seen a lot of people give. Yeah, I love what Christy said. Squirrel. Oh, right. Because that's what it is. It's actually our lizard brain, so to speak, our monkey brain. There's a couple of different terms for it. And I just saw a meme on Instagram this morning that I tried to copy and put into the PowerPoint, but I couldn't. And it had two bubbles. And the bubble on the left said, when I do something good, I say to myself, yay, you did something good. When I do something not so good, I say to myself, you stupid blah, 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 blah. And why can't you? And you don't do. And blah, 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 blah. blah. And so the bubble on the right was like this long and the bubble on the left was this long. It's partially because one of the other ways that our brain works is it has a negative bias. We are built to have a negative bias. We are built to look for the coming disaster at just about every turn. It's, you know, Louise, uh, Louise just, um, mentioned Brene Brown, and she talks a lot about that in her books. But here's the question that I pose uh, that I pose to you. If you have this these unconscious biases, whereby you have thoughts that you don't control about yourself that tend to beat yourself up, what are the chances that you have those same unconscious biases about other people? Pretty high. So here's a definition of unconscious bias. This is from Dr. Jennifer Eberhardt. She's a social psychologist at Stanford University. Unconscious bias are the beliefs and feelings we have about social groups that can influence decision making in our behavior, even when we're not aware of it. Okay. It was baked into my brain from the time that I was eight or nine years old, that my body was not good enough. What are the things were baked into my brain about other people, other situations? Not all negative. Some of them were positive, right? It, go, it does go both ways. But again, we do tend to have a negative bias. 
So take a very close look at this picture. Go ahead and put a thumbs up in the chat when you get what this guy is doing. We don't see things as they are, we see them as, as we are. Anytime we approach a project as instructional designers and trainers, we approach it from our viewpoint. And our viewpoint came from the surroundings in which we grew up. As I often say, if you grew up white and middle class in the state of Connecticut, you see the world differently than if you grew up black and middle class in the state of Connecticut, which is where I happen to live. If you grew up white and middle class in the state of Connecticut, you see the world differently than if you grew up white and poor in another part of the country. I often refer to it, our family units and how we grew up as sort of mini cults because they shape how we see the world. If we grew up in a family where there was safety, there was security, there was food on the table, there was shelter, there wasn't a lot of trauma, then we see the world differently. If we grew up in the opposite situation where we never knew where our next uh, meal was going to come from, where there was a lot of insecurity, we see the world differently. These are part of the things that help us get, that help these ideas, these thoughts about ourselves, about the world to get baked into our brain. And it's the thinking that helps us to dismantle it. Yes, we have de default comfort zones and we have, thank you for that, Risa, and we have default, default things that we normalize, okay? So here's a, a little game that we're going to play. Now, this is a little tough because I can't see you guys. I can't get verbal feedback, but you're going to play this in your own surrounding, and then you'll give me feedback afterwards. And here's what I want you to do. First off, if there's someone else in your surrounding, grab a piece of paper and a pencil. I'll give you a second while I sip. If you are in your surrounding by yourself, you can just say things out loud. Okay. I'm going to say a word or a phrase, and you're going to either write down or say aloud the first thought that comes to your head, into your head. Do not think. Here we go. Peanut butter. Cold. Angry. A black teen in a hoodie. A female leader. A trans person. A white man. A cop. A black woman arguing a point. Okay, so for some of you, there may have been thoughts that went through your head that you were like, ew, I don't actually think that, but that's the thought that went through my head. And what happens is when these thoughts are in our brains, when they, they make us behave oftentimes in a certain way, they help us to frame how we see the world even if it's not necessarily what we believe, okay? Doesn't let us off the hook, but it is how our brains literally work. Now, Luis, do we have the video or no? I'll take that as a no. <laughs> we, were we were struggling, there he is. I do, I have it. 
Awesome. And, yeah, and it's going to start in just a second. Implicit bias. Implicit bias. Implicit bias. Bro. 2016 was the year that implicit bias went somewhat mainstream. Yeah, so when Hillary Clinton mentioned implicit bias in the debates, our phones started blowing up, all our friends started emailing us about it. But what is implicit bias? Implicit biases are basically thought processes that happen without you even knowing it. Little mental shortcuts that hold judgments you might not agree with. And sometimes the shortcuts are based on race. First, some clarity. Saying someone has an implicit bias is different from calling someone a racist. The word racist is a highly loaded term, right, here in American society. A lot of times, when people are using it, they're thinking of the kind of old-fashioned Ku Klux Klan style racist. But implicit bias isn't anywhere near that, you know, explicit. Implicit bias is something that comes out of ordinary mental functioning, out of how the mind normally works. We've all grown up in a culture with media images, news images, conversations we heard at home, our education. Think of that as a fog we've been breathing our whole life. We never even realized it, what we were taking in. And that fog causes associations that lead to biases. I somehow know that if you say peanut butter, I'm gonna say jelly. That's an association that's been ingrained in me because throughout my life, peanut butter and jelly are together. And in many forms of media, there is an over-representation of black men and violent crime being paired together. And because of that, I actually deep down inside have been taught that black men are violent and aggressive and not to be trusted, that they're criminals, that they're thugs. With all those associations, I'm not trying to let us off the hook, but in some ways, none of us stood a chance. Starting today, we'll post a video a day dealing with one challenge of understanding implicit bias and its relationship to race and exploring ways we might combat the problem. One more thing, if you're seeing this and thinking that it doesn't apply to you, well, you might be falling prey to the blind spot bias. That's the scientific name for a mental bias that allows you to see biases in others, but not in yourself. We're biased. <gasps> Thank you, Louise. So uh, Gwen had a question in the chat. What if your thought were from the associations that it was doing were uh, of a specific person instead of a thought? Um, I'm going to guess maybe the person was Trayvon Martin because I get that a lot when I say black teen in a hoodie. But if it wasn't, that's OK. That's not it's not like a test of how uh, if of who it is that you think of, it's a test of what your thought process is, right? It's just a check into what your thought process is. Um, and it's not always negative. Not every association of what I might have said is, ne is necessarily negative. Yep. Uh, and me too, Christy, because I have a trans member of my family. So when I say trans person, that's who I think of, right? Very lovingly. And they're doing fabulous. And I'm so happy for them. So we don't control the thoughts in our head, but we do control what we do with them. Once we catch them, check them, hear, hear, that, hear it, catch it, check it, and change it. Okay, so here's the thing, though, that we have to make sure that we understand. This is how our brain works. We are human. Unless there's anybody on this call who has come from another planet, and if you have, we want to talk to you in another session. So please raise your hand, let, let Luis know, and we'll set that one up. But as human beings, this is literally how our brain works. Okay, so let's bring that back for a second. Let's step back. Who makes up our society? human beings. They make up our media. They make up our religions. They make up our politics. They make up our justice system. Okay. They make up all our education system. So if everybody on this call is human and we all have these biases, guess what? So does the rest of the world. So let me prove it to you. So uh, this is from the book, Witnessing Whiteness. 
And she points out that this is how unconscious bias, implicit bias manifests. During Hurricane Katrina, a newspaper published a photo of a white couple wading through floodwaters with food. The caption read, two residents wade through chest deep water after finding bread and soda from a local grocery store after Hurricane Katrina came through the area. Another newspaper had a photo of a young black man wading through floodwaters with food and the caption read, a young black man walks through chest deep floodwaters after looting a grocery store in New Orleans. So the question I have back to you is, what do you have noticed? If you read those captions on two different days, would you have noticed that somehow the white couple was resourceful, but the young black man was somehow a criminal. These things get so baked into our society that it takes a consciousness on our part to stop and think. And thank you, Bridget, for being honest, of that, uh, honest about that. Here are the actual captions from the two uh, newspapers. And just a funny side note, I was, I used this in the class that I teach and one day somebody pointed out, actually, it's the black guy who's resourceful because he, he brought a big bag. Like he was, he was prepared to find food, right? I thought that was pretty funny. All right, so I'm gonna test you again. This is a resume, okay? Her name is Stacy D. White. She has a BA in marketing from the University of Pennsylvania. Go ahead and put into the chat your first impression of Stacy. The thought that goes through your head. Good school, thank you, Risa. Yep, academic. Anybody else? Okay, a white woman maybe, got it. Female, yep. Young in their 20s or 30s, okay. <laughs> Love it, Christy Tucker. Oh, marketing, ugh. She also has an MBA from Columbia University School of Business. Go ahead and put it in the chat. What's your next impression? What's the first, next thought? Don't think. Impressive, smart, ambitious, successful. Got it. Very educated. Impressive. Yep. Driven. Great. Yep. Middle class, well educated. Family has money. Interesting. Okay. Older than I thought before. Qualified, got it, ambitious, yeah, okay, impressive. Next, speaks man Mandarin fluently, speaks conversant Japanese, French, and Spanish. Go ahead and put it in the chat. Privileged. Well-traveled, impressive, smart, overachiever. Yeah, I think Mandarin was her first language. Multicultural, worldly. Okay, possible immigrant, got it. She's over 55. First impression in the chat. Unemployed. Uh, multilingual, multicultural, experienced, experienced, elderly. Thank you, Bridget, on behalf of everyone over 55. <laughs> Older, <laughs> well-traveled, yep. Director level, okay. Potential for leadership role, yep. All right. What race or ethnicity is she? Go ahead and put that in the chat. No idea, yeah. 
Again, your first thought. First thought. Asian, got it. Chinese, yep. Yeah. Not sure. Is it definitely female? Chinese, maybe Taiwanese, no idea. But her last name is suggestive for no reason. First thought was Asian, Singaporean. Okay. All right. What if, oops, I gave it away. What if her resume said Khadija D. White instead of Stacy D. White? What would, might you think? Would that change how you saw the qualifications on her resume if the name was Khadija and not Stacy? You would immediately think she's black. Yeah. More impressive because of what else she's probably had to deal with. Got it. All right. So this is Stacy White. This is my cousin, by the way, and my last name is Brown. I'll let you take that one in for a moment. <laughs> Thank you. That's a compliment. Thank you, Risa. All right. And that is Stacy's uh, resume. She works in the diversity office at uh, Syracuse University currently. But I use this because oftentimes, and some of it was reflected in the chat, we just have immediate thoughts that go through our head. She did not grow up privileged. She grew up living in a condo, what, what most people consider privilege. She did grow up privileged. She had parents and a roof over her head and so forth. But she grew up living in a condo in downtown Detroit. Her parents both worked. Her dad was an entrepreneur. Her mother was an art teacher, my aunt. Um, and so I use that as part of sort of a, a another test into how our thinking process works. So again, from Dr. Jennifer Everhart of Stanford University, unconscious bias can be at work without our realizing it. And even when we genuinely wish to treat all people equally, ingrained stereotypes can infect our visual perception, attention, memory, and behavior. This has an impact on education, employment, housing, and criminal justice. Um, all right. So where do, do these biases come from? How, they are baked into our brain. We've established. Where do they come from? Well, they come from stereotypes. And those stereotypes create the lenses through which we see the world. They come from family, religion, school, peers, media, community, personal experiences. In, in essence, my parents had a stereotype that a young girl uh, I and a woman who was not in, who did not have a beautiful body would somehow not do well in the world, right? And we all know there's a ton of fat shaming that goes on in our world. And so that's how they get baked into our brain. Some, at some point along the way, we picked up a stereotype and they manifest within ourselves sometimes without us knowing them by, being, by the judgy. So we'll hear ourselves in our brain or saying out loud, they should, they shouldn't. Why don't they? How come they can't? When your behavior changes, you it changes because of these biases and you feel needlessly cautious somehow. You become needlessly impatient or cranky. I had a situation once where I had a very difficult situation with my phone and I got on the call with someone and I suddenly became really super cranky with this very kind gentleman from T-Mobile. And I was so like cranky that I, I was pissing my own self off. Like I was, I was annoying myself. That's how bad it was. And I had to pull back for a second and ask myself, why are you behaving this way? And something came into my head and it was this. He has an accent that is different from mine. 
and he's not going to be able to help me and this is a waste of my time. It was my own unconscious bias coming forward. Okay, it was my own unconscious bias floating to the surface, surface and I was behaving in a manner that I didn't want to behave. And he was lovely and he didn't solve my problem because it wasn't my problem. I won't go into what it was, but yeah, caught myself there. So ask yourself when these things happen, what's going on? What stereotype or implicit bias is leading to this behavior? Even those with unconscious biases can say or do something. And remember, please, that even someone with unconscious biases can do something, say something that is racist or something they say or do is received as racist from the point of view of the receiver. So impact, intent versus impact. You may not mean to say something. You may not mean to behave in a way, but the impact is somehow racist or bigoted, okay? And that's the point that uh, Dr. Everhart was making. So one more quick story before we turn this over to how, how this affects what we create. This is my friend Todd and his wife, Kelly. And Todd tells this very, uh, this story about one time he was in an office building and he uh, stood in front of the elevator door and the elevator door opened and uh, there was a woman inside the elevator and she had her purse underneath her arm. And now Todd is, he's about six foot six and he used to play for the Tennessee Vols. So he weighs about 350 to 400 pounds if he weighs an ounce. He's a huge, huge human being. So the door, elevator door opens. The woman has this purse underneath her armpit. She sees Todd and she moves over to the side of the elevator and she switches the purse underneath the other arm and leans against the elevator wall. So Todd enters the elevator. He dutifully takes his place over against the opposite wall. He looks at her, takes his wallet out of his back pocket, puts it underneath his armpit and leans against the opposite wall and says to her, it's okay, they're not gonna get mine either. So the question is, was that an implicit bias on her part? Did she actually know she was doing that? Because at some point there was probably a stereotype that got baked into her brain that said large black men are dangerous. Did she know? Obviously the impact was not good, even if the thought intent was not there, okay? All right, so now let's talk about this in our work. So um, I know Aaron, I don't know if Aaron's on the call today, uh, but I know Erin is talking about this very similar topic tomorrow when it comes to how we see the world socially. But when we approach any kind of work, whether it's facilitation, whether it's e-learning, we have to remember that we are coming at it from how we see the world. We can't not, okay? It's not a bad thing, it's not a good thing, it's an is thing. We can't not come at it from how we see, other than how we see the world. All right, so from my own life, there's two examples. Uh, one of them recently happened whereby um, uh, I was asked to redo a RISE course. And the RISE course that I was asked to redo, um, the 
person who gave it to me said, the SME on the account said, um, so this is a RISE course that I did and I'm not an instructional designer and I know that it's really terrible and that's why we want you to redo it. Her words, not mine. Okay. But one of the things that I noticed as I went through the course was she had a lot of scenarios that were set up in the course that I, um, you know, embellished and, uh, and did uh, revamped. And in all of the scenarios, she had two characters, a female and a male. And the female would always ask the male for his expert opinion. Ouch. So I was uh, kind of taken aback by that. And I did my best as I went through to make sure that we evened out and had a little bit, now these are characters, but still had a little bit more equity in how many times the woman was speaking with authority and how many times the man was speaking with authority in these scenarios. Um, and then another one, uh, the, one of my colleagues with this situation was on the line. We had created um, a very large, I had created a very large, very lengthy e-learning um, in Storyline that was approved by the client, approved by my client, approved by her client. But when we went back and looked at it, there were lots of problems with it when it came to basic accessibility. And that was a real learning for me because I was thinking graphic design, but sometimes graphic design and accessibility, as we all know, don't necessarily go together. And so there were a lot of things that we had to change in it. So here are some basic tips, and I look forward to hearing more tips from you guys uh, as, um, as we get into the question and answer portion. So when you get information from SMEs, see if you can figure out their point of view. Like what's their, to put it this way, what is their rhinoceros, rhino horn? Why can't I say that word? What is their horn? Like what are they seeing in the universe from their point of view that you might be able to broaden? And this goes without saying, and we all do this, but maybe think of it in a slightly different way. Ask as many questions as possible about the audience for whom you're designing, their occupation, their gender breakdown, the race, ethnic breakdown, disability, education. Like I just put a couple of examples there. Okay. And after you've developed, take a step back and see if it matches the audience. Like I'm finishing up that RISE course and it occurred to me yesterday, I need to step back. Did I overcorrect? When I found that situation where, she, where they had the female character constantly asking the male character for his expertise, did I overcorrect and put the female character in too often? Because I see the world as a female, right? Also asking the SME, who might the audience become? Because maybe they don't have anybody on their staff at the moment who needs some sort of accessibility. Doesn't mean they might not hire someone in the future. Um, and ask questions. Remember, you can't know what you can't know. Now, you've probably heard it say, you don't know what you don't know. But what I mean by saying it this way, you can't know what you can't know is this. I can't know what it's like to be male. I can't know what it's like to be black. I can't know what it's like to be gay, right? So ask questions. Did I get this right? Is this, is this tone correct? What am I missing here? Okay, be curious about it and listen. Listen to the feedback. And look, I'm not gonna lie, and you guys know this, but Sometimes, as instructional designers, feedback is tough. Like, we take pride in our work. We take pride on how we put things forward. And we don't necessarily like it when someone goes, mm, mm, mm. But that's also how we learn. We must be conscious of our unconsciousness. 
we must do our best to be to know that I'm going into this situation with a certain point of view, a bunch of unconscious biases, not a good thing, not a bad thing, an is thing. Where can I broaden? Where can I open up? Where can you give me feedback that helps to see the world in a different way? All right. And um All right, so I've got tons of stuff in the chat. So uh, I want to take some questions. Luis, do you want to come back and help me out here? Tell me what came to your mind. Were there any examples of, of times when you've had an instructional design situation where maybe you realized after the fact, mm, didn't quite get that? All right, folks, let's see. If you want, you can also add questions over into the Q&A area. If you look at the top of the, like over where um, in the in the chat, um, uh, on the top of the chat area, you can see sort of some icons. There's one with two little dialogue bubbles that um, that's for Q&A. If you want to add questions in there, um, we can catch those and show them on the screen from there as well. Yeah, I want to go back to something that Tina said about removing the names. That is that is done in some organizations where the name is stripped out. It's also often done sometimes with um, actually plays. So interesting fact about the theater, about 10% uh, of all plays produced or less, 7% I think it is, are written by women. I'll let you do that math for a second. And so there's a lot of regional theaters who, when you submit a play, you do a blind submission so that they don't know whether a woman or a man or someone with an more what we would consider in the United States a more ethnic name. Remember, the name John is ethnic probably in other countries, right? Where we can consider a more ethnic name uh, is stripped out of the submission. Um, so thank you for that, Tina. All right, I have one here from from Asu Cervantes. Um, question is, when we say who might the audience become, what do you mean by this exactly, please? So what I mean by this is, is the, is the organization opening to designing it with accessibility, even though they may not have someone who necessarily needs it at the, at the moment? So uh, once upon a time, I was a contractor at a company called Monsanto. And Monsanto, I had to design, I was in the uh, cybersecurity, I was designing for cybersecurity work. And uh, they had someone in the general counsel's office who was blind. And so we always had to make sure that we had narration to anything that we designed so that she could take the course, right? So asking those questions now, now, if the company is small, that's going to cost them more money. And certainly there are situations where um, companies can't hire people with disabilities because the job that is required means that somebody in a wheelchair can't climb up on a ladder, right? And we need people who can climb up on ladders. We need people who can do physical work. So that's what I mean. Just ask the question of, do you have, you know, are you open to hiring people who may need different accessibility things? Should we go ahead and put in closed captioning just in case we have somebody with a hearing disability in the future? Um, yeah, more and more people are actually coming down with, coming up with, I don't know how to, that's, I don't know what the right terminology, but needing hearing aids, which is one of the reasons the government just took it out of prescription. And it's because of all the t all the years of us walking around with stuff plugged into our ears. So. Yikes. All right. Um, have one from Christy Tucker. Have you ever had to deal with SMEs, stakeholders who didn't want to make changes to remove bias or were they resisted? How did you handle it? That's a good question, Christy Tucker. I'm going to open that back up to the group because I haven't I haven't had that situation. Probably what I did in that situation is akin to what I'm doing with the current situation where I just changed it and figured that if they wanted it changed back, they'd say, 
you know, go ahead and, and could you do it this way? Um, one of the things that I think that sometimes we are restricted to in that, uh, in that situation though, is the, um, so for instance, for those of us who design in articulate, we are restricted to the pictures that they have, which all tend to be of very thin people. And articulate, when they first came out with their, their pictures, they were kind of slammed because they, they geared towards very white looking people. We're also sometimes um, pigeonholed when it comes to things like um, Adobe st or iStock or other uh, you know, photo based uh, databases like that. I remember years ago when I was designing for my last corporate company, we would look for pictures of business women and we come out with these pictures of women in these tight suits with low cut shirts uh, in these sexy poses. And that was mostly what we would find when we search for business women. Now, I think that a lot of those websites have course corrected in a way, but sometimes we are, um, we are a little bit hand tied with what's there for us. I have a, one of my best friends who's a vice president of a company. She posted just this morning on LinkedIn about how she was once told that um, big girls, this is her words, big girls with long hair and long nails won't get very far in business because no one takes them seriously, right? So these stereotypes are out there all the time. And it struck me when I read her post that I don't think there's a lot of people of sort of different sizes and shapes, so to speak, in Articulate's database. And that's problematic, right? There's no one in, a, in the photographs in, of someone in a, wheel, a wheelchair, or maybe they have them within the poses. But yeah. Yeah, there is some... A great um, chat content coming through from, you know, from Christy Kettle and Denise and Risa. This is such an intriguing question. Um, okay, let me move on to the next one. Um, Christy Kittle is asking, do you have a good resource slash strategy to help IDs and learning professionals respond to an experience where they identify biases in their SMEs or coworkers or how to call it out respectfully? Uh, so here's a couple of tools. One is, what do you mean by that? I, I, I would think that that's not all fill in the blank. Black people, women, men, trans people. I think that's probably just a specific person. Was there a specific person you were thinking about? Assume good intent. It's hard to assume good intent when someone says something that you find to be vile, right? But we've all made mistakes. And by the way, that's one other thing that I'm going to uh, say is that we're all going to make this mistake. We're all going to overcorrect. So I see that the module that I was given is asking the female character, is asking the male character for expertise and input. I need to make sure I don't overcorrect that. Um, the word ouch works really well, Christy, especially if it's at you, if it comes towards you, okay? Or if they say it about someone else, ouch. Wow, okay, what do you mean by that? Do your best to keep it light. And um, I would also, also say, so is one of the values of your company, you can ask this question, is one of the values of your company inclusivity? And just, and be silent. And that's the power of the, what did you mean by that question? Because it helps to check the person and see if that's what they actually meant 
or that was the thought that went through their head that they said out loud. Mm -hmm. They weren't thinking. Okay. And I can't stress this enough. <laughs> We're all going to screw this up at one point or another. You know why? Because we all have rhino horns. We just mm -hmm. are, you know, I screwed it up royally in a facilitation I did back in August. It was like, and I got caught, thank, thank God, I got called out. And I was devast I was curled up in a ball for two days. Like I was devastated that I had done this. I was like, oh my God. The person who owned the facilitation company was like, oh, wait a minute, you mean you were human? You grew up in a racist America? What? Now I had to go back and understand what it was that I did, right? I had to understand it. I had to own it. I had to cop, you know, I had to cop to it. Still didn't make me feel good about myself. I had to apologize. I had to shut up. I had to listen. The shut up part is really key. <laughs> All right. But All right, Bridget. Oh, sorry. No, go ahead, Luis. Okay, one more. Let's the um, last question here. Um, this one's from Denise. Um, as an ID, what can you do to address microaggressive feedback? For instance, wanting a character voice change to higher pitch for a woman because it doesn't sound feminine enough, according to an SME. Wow. Oh, Denise, I'm so sorry. Um, that's another, that's an ouch. That's a, oh, ouch. Now I will say this, and I know that a lot of people have going, a lot of, um, developers have started using things like well said labs. And sometimes the voices, the computer oriented voices do sound a lot of this, a lot the same pitch wise. And so if it's a differentiation between who's talking, not male or female, I'm not talking male or female, but just which character's talking, that's one thing. Um, but I would just ask the question of, does every woman have a high pitched voice? Just innocently ask the question. This is when your acting skills, guys, kind of come into play because in that situation, Denise knows what they're asking. Assume good intent. I'm not sure every woman has a high pitched voice. Is it a differentiation issue? Do you, do you think that this particular voice is not differentiated from the other one in the module? That may be a way to ask it. That is so fascinating. This, the questions in the Q&A and just the, the conversation that's happening in chat. I am so intrigued by all this. I'm definitely going to have to go back and try to catch everything. Um, I absolutely love it. Um, I love this too. I wish yeah. we had more time. I know. It's like this is this is a whole other session unto itself, like where we could yeah. kind of workshop yeah. this stuff through because it's it really is um, really compelling. Um, all right. Well, I, I do need to wrap it up. We're like getting to the top of the hour. Um, Bridget, I want to thank you so much for having such a wonderful and engaging session. It was great to have you back here at TLDC and especially for the, our event, Ideal 22. Um, I am, yeah, just honored to have you back. And hopefully we'll see you again at some time. If you ever need anything at, at all from our little community here, please feel free to reach out. And everybody, um, let's see, 10 o'clock, we're going to be joining um, Kayleen Holt. Um, Kayleen Holt is going to be talking about um, Accessibility DEIB. guru, Kayleen. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And her inclusive learning pledge. So um, please come back and join us um, at 10 o'clock. And if you have some time, just take some time to reflect on the session and what you've learned. I love having these, you know, these breaks after in between to, um, to really let some of this stuff um, seep in. So um, with that. Well, shout, we'll out, shout out to you real quick, Luis, for doing oh. this in the first place. Thank you everyone who attended today. Thank you so much for the great feedback. Um, please feel free to reach out if you have any more questions. Um, and as we do the mad jazz hands, <laughs> thank you very much, Louise. Thanks, everyone. All right. Yeah, absolutely. Bye, everybody. We'll see you soon.